Now let's talk about preparing stems for yourself if you're going to be mixing the track. And using the word stems may not really be appropriate here because chances are we're not going to have to go in here and bounce out stems for every single track. Now some people will tell you that if you are going to mix your own music, you should follow the same guidelines I showed you in the first video. And if you want to do that, that's totally fine. But typically, if you make a lot of music in the computer and you're using a lot of virtual instruments, and even if you don't have a lot of experience, you kind of know the balances you're going for. You kind of know the responses that you want to get, whether that's a frequency response or, you know, dynamic range. And so you're making all of those considerations while you're making your music. It's not like you're recording something and then you're going to be going in and mixing it later. You're kind of constantly mixing on the go because if things seem and feel a little out of whack when you're making the song, you're probably going to go back and fix those things at the time of and not wait until the mix stage. So for that reason, I've kind of found, especially over time, that I get better results by working within the same project, or I should say duplicating my original project and then working within that duplicate, not necessarily starting something brand new and bringing in a bunch of stems. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the big reasons is if you do a lot of automation, and you'll notice this when you, uh, or if you try to mix my track, that there's probably some weird like volume automation things that are gonna seem confusing to you. And that's because you haven't been working with the balances that I was working with. And if you're not doing that, then it's not gonna really make a lot of sense. But to me, all of that automation makes sense based on this kind of initial balance that I've set thus far. And thus, if you are working with my stems, you might have to go back and do some like counter automation, meaning that you're really just automating it differently to counterbalance what I've done if you're interpreting my song differently. And that's really uh, the beauty of mixing is that we're all going to interpret music differently and decide on different balances and you know kind of make those uh, judgment calls on what the most important element is in the track, whether it needs more bounce, does it need more reverb, what about like frequency response and, and getting separation between our parts. All of those things we are going to interpret differently as mix engineers and just in general as people. So if you're working with your own track and you'd prefer not to go through that lengthy process that we just looked at, I'm going to talk about what you're going to want to consider and what you're going to want to do before you begin mixing. And the first thing and what's probably most important is again that you make a duplication, you save that, and thus if something goes really horribly wrong, you can always go back and recover what you've worked on. The other thing is that the next video that we're going to have coming up is probably more important than this video or the previous video where we talk about the considerations before you start mixing. So, for example, like taking two or three weeks uh, away from the track, spending some time working on something else so that you can get a fresh ear to it. If I was going to try to mix this right now, I just finished this track a couple days ago, I probably wouldn't be listening to it with a fair ear, meaning that I'm expecting so many things to happen. Maybe I've just blocked something out. But if I come back a few weeks later and I listen to it, even with these relative balances I've set here, I'll probably pick up on uh, whatever it is that's, you know, maybe a little bit out of whack and then I can put it into place. So your two biggest enemies are CPU and visual clutter. And right now you can tell that we already have a lot of CPU usage going on. And if I was to play this track back, there'd be times when this would be going over 50%. And again, I'm already at the longest buffer setting. So I wanna clean things up like I did before. I can get rid of these deactivated synth parts here. And then the next thing I wanna do is just go through and look and see how many processors I'm using on some of these tracks. So if I go, I look at the kick, there's nothing, the snare, there's nothing, the percussion loop, there's a decent amount of stuff going on here. So let's talk about how I would handle this situation. The first thing I notice is that I have volume automation going on this percussion loop. And I can see that volume automation happening here. What I'm gonna do for now is actually turn this off. Okay, and I'll explain why in a second. I'm turning this one off, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here, and I'm going to bounce this track. I'm just gonna get the whole region, and maybe a little bit beyond in case there's any kind of reverb tail. I'm not necessarily gonna get that full range like what we saw with the stems we created, so this is a way to help uh, save you a little bit of uh, uh, space if you're worried about that with your computer and your hard drive. And I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna right click, and I'm gonna bounce it, 
bounce in place would mean it's happening on the track. Bouncing is going to create a separate track, and that's what I want right now. So I'm going to bounce this out. I'm going to go ahead and choose pre-fader, so it's going to be a lot louder than the fader I have set here. I'll click OK, and it's going to start bouncing that track for me below. So we'll pause it, we'll let it do its thing, and then I'll talk about how we sync this back up and why this is going to end up saving CPU. All right, so it just finished bouncing, and now what we have is practically a duplication of this track, except for a couple of things. One is pan position, and number two is the volume automation. So if I turn the volume automation back on, we can even like just bring this up for now. Let's put this at like minus 15. Let's put this at minus 15, and we'll listen to the differences here. So let's listen to the original. Okay, so you can hear that volume automation going on. And now if we listen to the bounce we have. It's identical minus the pan position and minus the volume automation. So what am I gonna do here? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the percussion loop and I can actually just go in here and I can get rid of all of these clips. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of those clips. The next thing I'm gonna do is get rid of the plugins that we just used because it's captured that in the bounce. So I can get rid of these plugins. And now all I'm left with is the tool. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take this guy and I'm gonna literally drag it back up onto the percussion loop track. So by doing that, if I go in here and I look at my gain automation, it should be the same. We now have our pan position matched up. And if I play this back, now it's gonna sound like what we were just hearing the first time. All right, like so. Now, I shouldn't have probably moved that fader because I don't remember where this is supposed to be, but that's fine. I'll be able to figure it out when I go back and mix it. I'm not even concerned right now with making balance changes or doing any kind of mix moves. That is not important at this point. This is really about saving CPU and then reducing any kind of clutter. So we now have that percussion loop. We were able to get rid of some plugins. I can delete this excess track. And now all I'm gonna do for the rest of this time is go through, see if I can, excuse me, reduce any clutter. And if I see that there's something with a really long chain on it, I'm gonna go ahead and bounce it. So go through, do that, make those adjustments. And then there is one final thing that you can do if your program allows it. So I'm not gonna worry necessarily about bouncing every single thing that has a plugin on it. I feel like I don't have to do that much in the mix anyway, so I shouldn't run into CPU problems. It's only when I look at tracks like this where it's pretty obvious that I need to make uh, a bounce. So the other thing I'm gonna do, and this is just as a uh, sort of an organizational thing, is I wanna make sure that I'm differentiating the processors I've used during the production and the processors that I'm gonna be using in the mix. And the way I'm gonna do that is with this program's FX Chains device. So if I go in here to something that has a plugin on it, even if it's just the tool device like we have here on the percussion loop, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna choose my FX chain. A lot of these uh, programs have this, not all of them do, but a lot do. I'll grab the chain, bring it in. And now what I can do is just nestle that effect in here and I can bring it down and basically just collapse it. So now when I start my mix, I know that all of my processors going on are mixed processors and all the chains are just collapsed in to tell me this is what I've done in production. This is what I'm doing in the mix. One final hypothetical situation worth discussing is what happens when you have group tracks with a lot of processing and then individual tracks with processing and you wanna be able to bounce these, but then you want them to be separate. Meaning that with this bell percussion here, let me just make sure I don't have anything else soloed. With this bell percussion, what I want is I want these two guys to be separate because I might wanna process these sounds separately, but I wanna bounce this so I don't have all of this effects going on right now. What am I gonna do? Okay, and what if I have a tool device as well that's doing volume automation that I'm gonna to wanna to turn off? This can get a little bit crazy, but the way I'm gonna work this is by actually bouncing the group, but individually soloing 
the parts that I have. So if we listen now. We're hearing the bell perk and we're hearing that with this Valhalla frequency uh, echo plugin on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the group and I'm just going to go and drag over here. You can see that's highlighting the whole group right now, which is fine. And then I'm just going to take it and that's too much space on the end. So let's bring that back. I'm going to take it. I'm going to bounce it. Pre-fader is fine. And here you can see it's creating that bounce down here. I'm going to pause it again and we'll come back. All right, so once it bounces, what you're going to notice is that it's included it in the group. So if I play this back right now, it's actually going to get this group processing happening twice because we haven't turned that off yet. But if I pull this outside of the group and now I listen to the soloed version and now the bounced version, Apart from the volume difference and apart from the pan difference, we're exactly the same. So all I have to do now is repeat the steps, only this time I'm going to mute the bell percussion and I'm going to have the cowbell soloed. So. so let's go ahead and do the same thing we did before. We're going to bounce this out. I'll pause the video and come back and show you then how we're gonna put these all back together. All right, it's just finished up. So now what I need to do is just go ahead and rename these guys. I know that this is the cowbell. I know that this is what I call the bell perk. And now I can go into the bell perk. I can go ahead and I can delete these plugins. I can turn this guy back on. I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to delete all of these clips for the bell perk. I'm just gonna go and grab this, drag it on up. Just make sure it's in the right place. Okay, perfect. I'll repeat the process with the cowbell, just deleting all of that. Dragging it up. You can see I didn't make these things the same length, so I'll just go ahead and pull these in so that they're the same. And now, in theory, what we should have is a perfect replication, I can delete this effect as well, of what we had going on before. All right, so if I go and I listen to this now, we should have what the original sounded like, only now we've reduced our CPU quite a bit. So let's take a listen. You can see we have our gain automation happening as well. So you can tell it's down really low and that's because in the track, the balance is really low. I'm not worried about the balance. I just want to make sure that I'm getting the part that I had previously with all of the processing on, but I don't want to have to go in and like worry about changing all of the balances again. And that's why doing this method as compared to the method we saw before can sometimes be advantageous. So when I come back to this mix later on, I'm at a really good starting point. My CPU is down quite a bit. I'm actually going to go through here and grab a couple more tracks and uh, do what I just did here at the same process so that my CPU can be way down. And then when I get into the mix, I've already got a great starting point. I don't need to worry about any CPU overs and we'll be good to get this track all finished and polished and uh, ready to put up on the internet. So uh, the next video, we're going to be talking about some considerations that you want to make before you begin mixing your tracks.